So uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the presentation. Somehow I wasn't able to get to Zoom as uh, required. Uh, to do I have like hundreds of windows and I was not able to find the right one. Uh, but uh, it's I a good result. Yes, so it will be soon up. So uh, I will have slightly different uh, presentation than uh, the previous ones uh, because our department is focusing on a dialogue systems and uh, we are mostly working with uh, different uh, industrial partners uh, besides doing research. So I will also mention the research, but uh, very quickly, can, can you just click on it? Then there is a mail. Okay, so machines uh, are uh, not working. It's my failure because I was asked two days ago to prepare all the presentation of my team members on my computer. I was not able to play this role of the secretary of my presentation. So it's my failure because I did double check and he made a presentation. I saw that our researchers Okay, so we didn't manage uh, to make the computer to listen uh, or to know what uh, we need. <laughs> we need we needed to uh, do it. So the first uh, page shows uh, one of our uh, reading applications. It's a, a chatbot artist. Uh, we have done this, uh, or we have designed this for a group of uh, students, and we participated with this social bot in a uh, Amazon uh, uh, competition. And it was already five times we always uh, were between the uh, top three uh, competitors. Basically, uh, this bot is running on Echo devices, and uh, what it is doing is that uh, you can talk to it about uh, different topics such as sports, politics, celebrities, and uh, whatever comes into your mind. Uh, this is actually a screenshot of the latest version, which is uh, running on Echo devices with screen. So you can see uh, on the on the right, in the left uh, part of the window, uh, that uh, the system is uh, talking, but we don't need it because we don't have audio, but it shows this so-called karaoke effect. So what is being pronounced or what is being operated is uh, highlighted. And uh, this latest model is already using uh, the large language models. We don't use uh, GPT as everybody does. We are using much smaller models, uh, which are for this type of applications uh, put in on. Let me get to the next uh, application we had done last year for T-Mobile, and this application is uh, running on the T-Mobile web pages. It is, uh, uh, an application designed for customers buying network devices from or network support from uh, T-Mobile and allows very quickly to reset modem or to fix various problems uh, in the networking. The next application we also have done last year was for the check button office. And uh, it's also a bot, but this bot is uh, much more sophisticated than the previous one. And this bot is in check, and it's running on the UPV, which is uh, the event office. And uh, it is uh, actually guiding a new user through all the problems or all the difficulties uh, before you are able to uh, patent or to uh, file for a patent. As you can see on the right hand side, uh, there is a question and uh, check, unfortunately, not everybody would read it. So, uh, and there is the answer, and the answer is generated by 
uh, by the bot. So this uh, answer is something like FAQ, and the answers are there prepared by UPV and create a very simple application where anybody, uh, even the secretary, can prepare the questions, answers with a button and immediately stop and run. So when, for example, the opening hours are changing, then it's very easy, quick fix, and it's uh, all updated. The next application is uh, even more sophisticated and uh, uh, it shows a manual for a 6 foot series router. So the manual has about uh, 250 pages and there are lots of different procedures for setup and for setting uh, the machine to various modes and uh, it's quite complicated and this bot is running on a desktop. So on the right hand side, you can see the user interface. And if you have a, a problem, you may ask, for example, here is a, shown an example of asking, how do I reset the modem? And uh, the system goes uh, through the manual and finds uh, the answer in the manual. And the large language model in this case is uh, chat GPT generates the answer and displays the answer. And on the, on the left hand side, we jump to the PDF manual page uh, where we generated the answer from. So as the user has the capability to verify that uh, what is displayed is okay, or maybe browse through the manual and to find additional information if required. It is a, a block diagram how this works. It's uh, these days uh, uh, sort of uh, a general approach uh, where the manual is uh, chunked, let's say, two pages. We do it slightly differently than two pages. And we use a semantic, uh, semantic uh, measure to find out the page where is probably the answer to a query the user was asking and once uh, top three pages or top ten pages are identified as uh, relevant to the query, uh, we create a prompt, we send the prompt to LLM and generate answer. And here is uh, the research part. Uh, besides of uh, working with a lot of language models these days, uh, uh, which are uh, uh, smaller models, or they are something what we would call small large language models uh, with the number of parameters of uh, one up to maximum seven periods, because this is what we get actually, uh, or what we can handle on GPU cards we have available. So we do various kind of uh, testing, various kind of fine tuning. We do we fine tuning as well as full fine tuning of these models and use them uh, in different uh, situations. Uh, then uh, the other part or the models are listed, some of them here. And these are basically all of them models available on in the uh, open source. So it's uh, easy to get it and uh, easy to work with it. But takes a lot of time and a lot of patience because many of these programs are uh, quite complicated and long lasting. Uh, our vision for this year, we don't know if we can accomplish it, but so far we have collected a large number of uh, check texts. So we have now over uh, 300 billion of words, and uh, we would like to train a foundational. A change language model which would enable us uh, to create additional uh, like uh, topic concentrated models or topic focused uh, models and to train uh, even seven billion well, at least what we know from the literature and what we have calculated based on the aws prices uh, of these uh, large gpu cards uh, the cost of training the foundational model even the small one the 7 billion, the GPT-3 has 170 billion. So the 7 billion trained by uh, Facebook costs uh, something like 700 million dollars. 
So we have to find some tricks how to really push it out because seven hundred million dollars is something beyond uh, what we uh, sorry seven hundred thousand. Um, this is something what we certainly uh, cannot get for our research. So that's probably our last page. Uh, this is the team. So I'd like to take the opportunity and to thank all the students uh, working on uh, Artways and working on all the other uh, projects with us, the SARC PhD, as well as MC students. So thank you. Thank you. Any questions, please? Uh, can I ask when you ask ChatGPT to explain part of the scope or the menu of our parameters? So it again. So if I can ask uh, GPT what to explain part of the manual, how often does it do something? Ah, oh, that's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a fantastic question, but I have no answer. Everybody <laughs> 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 says. You know, they depends on these models, and the model says it works almost okay. like GPT 2.5, but nobody knows what it's almost. I know my question was simpler. I know, I know. But it is very hard to test it because uh, it always generates something with that, and the only way is semantic similarity. Semantic similarity can be measured, but uh, the measured value is, uh, we think it's applied. Okay. I'll tell you what we can do, but we cannot do much. We <laughs> don't know why it's new to people. <laughs> more, more, a, more a comment on the training. As I'll send you email that is on Google. Yeah, it's a big, there is a big problem. Because we, we, we you know about it. You know, we <laughs> you know about it, but all, all the programs we have are set up for CUDA. Doesn't work on Google. So we managed to work. Okay, okay. so if you, if you guide us, uh, we would be really very obliged because we have big problems with Carolina, etc. Et yeah, it's for everyone, we have We have already run several things on it, but with lots, lots, lots of problems. So let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> okay. uh, another issue you raised right now that's that concerns Carolina computing resources, how to use them, how to get them, and how to optimally use them. It's another topic for our internal discussion and for our discussion with this technical uh, I'm happy that you raised this issue as well. Uh, okay. Uh, where is the next presenter? Uh, so, uh, one practical application, practical industrial application in the sense it runs on the, in the production line. No. Yeah. No. So, there is no doubt that it is a industrial application, but it's necessary to wrap up this application. Uh, in a good report to be sent to the ministry, such a otherwise they don't recognize such application as useful. Thing. So, no. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Petr Novak, and uh, I will uh, talk about uh, smart counting machines for modular industry quarter zero uh, picking clients. Uh, this um, presentation. Uh, sorry, I will. Uh, okay. I'm looking how to how to hide the uh, okay um, and uh, this presentation uh, will uh, uh, will combine the experiences uh, from the practical application in uh, like of uh, where the system is uh, deployed and uh, in the operation and uh, this pre presentation is uh, partly based uh, on uh, the paper uh, that has the same uh, title and the same uh, authorship uh, which was presented uh, at the IPEG World Congress uh, in the last year. Uh, I will talk about uh, prepacking pre uh, Lego elements, Lego bricks. Uh, here uh, on the left hand side, you can see the uh, production line uh, in the factory. 
which is called the double brick spec line. It means that uh, the, uh, the counting machines uh, uh, that are counting uh, the, uh, the breaks are uh, organized into uh, two lines or two strings uh, that, are, that are then uh, connected uh, together. And um, the production line consists of uh, 36 uh, counting machines uh, that uh, you can see on the right hand side. Uh, and uh, these counting machines are calculating the required number of pieces, uh, which uh, which are dosed uh, into into the uh, into the the bag. And uh, um, just to clarify the terminology, uh, if you buy the the Lego. Uh, uh, like a box, uh, the, the paper box uh, is uh, called a box, and inside are the uh, small uh, plastic bags, uh, which are uh, called uh, pre bags in this presentation. So, uh, the scope is to how to improve uh, this uh, pre packing process, uh, how to uh, automate it better than it was and uh, make the entire packing uh, process uh, more efficient and uh, smooth. Um, we have uh, come up uh, in the several years of this uh, cooperation with uh, uh, the new improvement called uh, smart counting machines. Uh, smart counting machines are based on the legacy machine that are, uh, that are in the production for more than 10 years already. So it's the legacy hardware that is already in the factory, and we encapsulated uh, this hardware uh, with uh, the wrapper, which uh, uh, in the in the whole as a whole we call it uh, industry quantum zero component. And uh, this wrapper provides the OPC UI communication. Uh, it means the better uh, communication capabilities uh, to integrate efficiently the, the machine. Uh, and also uh, the automated scrapers, so some servo drives were added uh, to the counting machine to be able to uh, measure all the parameters and to set up it automatically and not uh, manually uh, like it was by human operators. And the purpose, uh, the main purpose is uh, to be able to grab the data from the production, uh, to uh, collect all the data, um, uh, process the data and learn from the human operators because it's very difficult to uh, linearize uh, this, uh, this system and to use the uh, traditional control techniques. Uh, we were not successful with uh, fuzzy replace control. We were not uh, successful with uh, uh, linearization of the system and uh, such uh, traditional control techniques. Therefore, we base our solution on learning from uh, humans and working with a uh, large amount, relatively large amount of data uh, from all the connected uh, devices uh, and uh, processing uh, this data. Right now, after several years of cooperation, this, uh, this uh, solution is uh, in the pilot operation running for 2027 on more than uh, 10 production lines uh, in the Vatna, which is, by the way, the biggest uh, packing facility of uh, Lego all over the world. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the um, uh, one part is the data processing of the records, the best performing records, uh, uh, which which uh, uh, whose, whose aim uh, is uh, on one hand uh, uh, process uh, the data for the given uh, given uh, Lego element. Uh, and uh, to consider some kind of average between different machines, uh, so so that uh, the tax for the like, uh, element uh, is uh, used uh, in the whole uh, factory. But on the other hand, uh, it's also needed to adjust the setting for the particular counting machine because in uh, numerous cases, the uh, counting machine is uh, either wrongly calibrated or, or uh, its surface uh, is uh, worn out, and therefore it makes sense to really customize the setup for the 
very particular uh, dumping machine and uh, its its uh, shape. Uh, for this, um, uh, we are using a clustering uh, of uh, best performing records, several strategies, uh, considering the uh, specific counting machine or the whole family of the counting machine and uh, different uh, filtering uh, criteria uh, that are uh, used. Uh, we deliver, uh, after the changeover, uh, at the beginning of the production, we deliver several uh, clusters, uh, cluster data to the counting machine, and the counting machine is trying the available uh, clusters. So uh, it's uh, set up uh, the, the, the setting. It's more than 20, 20 parameters that were in the past uh, set up by human operators. And right now, uh, this can be done fully automatically. Uh, by this uh, by the smart counting machine. After uh, testing uh, uh, these uh, several settings, uh, three to five settings uh, uh, resulting from the filtering and clustering, uh, we are trying to uh, fine tune the best per performing setup uh, by uh, some version of um, of. Uh, Yeah, fine tuning, fine tuning, uh, fine tuning slightly. Uh, this uh, setup uh, right now we are using some some kind of uh, simulated annealing, uh, but then in principle we can use also uh, other techniques to try to consider that uh, the combination is worn out or something like that, uh, just to do some uh, small adjustment uh, of the of the setup. Uh, the second project, which is uh, which is uh, still connected uh, to, to, uh, to the things uh, I was uh, talking about uh, until now, uh, is uh, measuring an analysis uh, of the energy consumption at uh, Prepec. Um, uh, we equate the, the Prepec with uh, um, energy measuring set, and we are analyzing analyzing the energy consumption under under different setup, uh, under different conditions of the operation of the counting machine, and uh, uh, this uh, the energy con consumption can be one of the optimization criteria for uh, setting up uh, the devices uh, for the production. Just uh, the illustration of uh, the energy consumption uh, per uh, devices. Uh, let me conclude. Uh, so, uh, what we uh, reached uh, uh, is uh, that, uh, with the use of the smart counting machine uh, in the daily production, uh, we can uh, save uh, one operator uh, per line. Until now, there were two. Um, Operators uh, for the whole operation uh, of the production line. Right now, there can be just uh, one. Uh, and also, uh, we've improved uh, several features like uh, uh, the uh, ramp up of the production uh, during the changeover uh, can be now uh, faster. Uh, the experience can be shared uh, from one line to, to another line because of uh, the uh, record set uh, of the best performing setups. Um, and uh, we are able to, to estimate in advance, uh, for example, the performance of the, of the production to, to, to better predict uh, how, uh, how long the production will take and uh, some the features again. Thank you for your attention. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Patrick It's my great honor to be chance to introduce to you uh, a project that uh, when I was preparing the first slide, I realized how big it was because I wasn't able to place all names of the involved people on the first slide and I have to make a dedicated slide to uh, the name of uh, active participants. So the project uh, is about second line batteries for energetics, and it's a project we do together with a Slovak company, ZKS, uh, that is actively involved in energetics problem, and they are trying uh, to find new ways how to replace 
the current most important stabilization factor of uh, energy arrays is uh, its uh, uh, coal power plants uh, that are used to, um, to to find the right balance between the current consumption and production. We know how to fly with uh, uh, coal power plants. Uh, we will have the, during the next session production that we are able to combine various sources to uh, to replace uh, uh, the old stabilization factors. But there is one issue: uh, batteries are very expensive. So the, our colleagues from from the gas uh, came up with an idea that they would take advantage of the growing market of used batteries from electric cars. They could disassemble uh, batteries, uh, check the individual modules that are uh, involved in batteries. They can create large containers that we will see uh, in a few minutes how they can be then used to provide the needed service. Uh, we are currently at the end of the first phase where we uh, develop various proof of concepts uh, that sh shows how uh, the technologies uh, provided by uh, Industry 4.0 actually can tackle this quite challenging problem. Why is it challenging? It's challenging because uh, the typical mass production technologies aren't uh, designed and suitable for the variability we need to tackle in this case. Uh, typically, at the beginning, during preparing the mass production, you have the clear idea what you are going to produce. So you have the model, the new car, and you are optimally designing the production line for it. But in this case, uh, we are preparing the set of technologies that you need to adapt as easily as possible, the new types of batteries that will come uh, to the market in the next years. So we need to design a system that can be easily identified by the model of the new battery type adopted to new production. Also, you don't have the control uh, over the quality of the input to the process if you are uh, if, if you are for the auto company, you have uh, strict contracts with your suppliers and you can force them to keep the quality of input, but if you are buying the used batteries, every battery will be different shape and you need to design the system in the way that it can react to the provide frequent failures and you need to, uh, to recover it from the issues in an automated way as possible. So this is the promised uh, promise, uh, slide naming all the four uh, groups of, of CERN that are involved in it. And if I put it there are 24 names uh, uh, mentioned here. So it was quite large and I'm glad that uh, they are becoming more often this project when, the, uh, when different uh, parts of CERN collaborate and achieve interesting results. So the project started the analysis of the domain of electric cars and the, uh, and the types of batteries uh, which are used in them. It was also necessary to get in touch with the, with the real battery. This is an example of BM, BMW i3 battery. Uh, this, uh, this deliberation was done in safe as, uh, environment provided by fire brigades. Uh, uh, yeah. Disassembled in this manual way uh, for uh, for batteries from BMW, Nissan, Nissan Leaf, Renault Zoe, and uh, OE Eagle. Uh, so, learning from this, don't throw away your screwdriver, even if you have uh, advanced robots in your uh, in your laboratory, because it's necessary to uh, really get into the physics, uh, into physical elements in the traditional way at the beginning. So after this analysis, uh, we designed uh, the first concept, how the process can be split in some automatic operation that can be then combined uh, uh, um, uh, in easy, easily reconfigurable way to, uh, 
to the various types of batteries. We did some capacity simulations uh, to estimate how many robots we will need uh, to meet some production uh, demands and production capacity demands. And after an approval of the first phase, we were allowed to start with preparation of some uh, physical demonstrators. What we can see here is the robot transporter uh, that moves the battery between various workstations. Um, we did uh, the control for the one single machine, but also uh, the colleagues developed a system to control the whole fleet with AGVs in an efficient way uh, to, to, to organize uh, to organize them in a way that uh, they uh, they achieve the best results as a team. Another robot uh, was named screwdriver. Uh, the screwdriver takes as input the model of the battery, uh, use the feedback from two cameras. The first camera is about the whole system and uh, uh, and compensates uh, differences uh, in the position where the AGV finish the transportation of the battery. The second camera, here you can see it in the detail, is placed close to the uh, automatic uh, screwdriver and navigates the robot to the precise position and detects that the screw is actually uh, ready to be to be uh, unscrewed by the, by the screwdriver. That the, the screw is in the right uh, right uh, shape. Uh, interesting thing is that the information gained uh, through this uh, through this camera is then propagated to the digital twin of the battery and is used also during the next phases of the deliberation process. Here we can see uh, the robot manipulator. Uh, interesting part here is the customized gripper. You can see it here uh, in the detail, the 3D printed structure. Uh, it's uh, designed for the specific task here. It can be changed and the plan is that this, uh, these grippers will be designed uh, for every new type uh, of, the, of the battery that will be needed to be to be assembled in the future. In this case, uh, we use uh, industrial computer vision system KIANS, uh, which provides us with a point cloud that uh, again helps the robot to navigate in a specific uh, situation, even if there are some deviations of the, sh of the shapes. Uh, related to this uh, to a specific uh, matter. Important part of the solution is manual workstation uh, because we assume that the result won't be able to handle all the possible situations uh, that can that can happen in practice. Uh, the information about uh, the output of the robotic operations propagated through the control system, the station, and uh, uh, the manual worker is then navigated with a beamer uh, to the to the place and point. There are some specific operations to be done. There is also automatically generated the list of operations that need to be corrected by the by the human operator, and uh, it combines. Uh, the systematic approach provided by the uh, um, um, <coughs> execution system and the uh, manual dexterity of the human operator. Now, I have just recently noticed that there is an instruction uh, that the unions will like that after all tasks are done, the operator is, uh, is sent to have a cup of coffee. So in the heart of the system, there is a, a PIMAS, uh, PI, an implementation of a manufacturing execution system developed here at CERC. Uh, this is a glue that connects all the components of the production. So using OPC UA, a communication protocol is connected to real machines. Uh, it creates a digital terrain uh, that formalizes uh, the, the states of individual components. The states are then uh, used to formulate 
the planning problem that is that is then uh, solved by a, uh, by a planner and scheduler and creates a specific set of operations, a specific plan that is then executed by the IMS uh, on the real machines. Uh, one of the outputs in this phase was a virtual factory, uh, actually commissioned factory that shows a set of uh, robotic and manual uh, workstations uh, aggregated in one uh, one short floor area. You know, we can see how the system is orchestrated and provides a good in insight into how the future system would look like. But uh, our task was to design and develop the system for one particular uh, factory. Uh, we uh, our task was to, to develop the technology that can be then combined uh, into various configuration based on the specific requirements uh, in certain locations. So part of the solution is also the optimization tool that using a heuristics, specifically genetic algorithms. Uh, combines the individual elements, individual workstations into the shape and topology that can produce the optimal result for the specific task. Uh, the good, uh, good thing is that uh, uh, the second phase of this, of this project was, was approved. Um, this year starts uh, the first industrial deployment of this technology. So I hope that Sir uh, will stay close to this project and even have a chance to move it further. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments, questions? Okay. I think these this assembly is a very important application for mm -hmm. recycling, but is the manual, is it like the most practical solution at the moment involves the manual labor and as you go for the application, is there any real long-term possibility to actually automate this? Because unscrewing should be doable, right? Uh, actually, uh, the unscrewing, the, the typical unscrewing is done by robot. There is the automatic screwdriver and it's done by screwdriver. But in case there is um, fail on the screw, so uh, it doesn't have the right shape, or there is something that was expected by the model. Uh, then we don't want to try by the robot to do something, and we just inform uh, 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 the human operator that there is an unstandard situation, and it's better to have a look at it before something physical is done. Because the video looks like it's an easy task, but actually, mm -hmm. only the operator solves the difficult. Problem. So you may yeah. have like seven mm -hmm. uh, multiple stations and one operator just doing multiple stations. Yeah, but the robot detects that there is something strange. Mm -hmm. the, the robot detects that it's a uh, non standard situation and then it, it, it involves the task that is then put to the plan uh, by, the, by the planner that there is something else needed to be done by the, uh, by the, the human. I think that's. Uh... It will for this case, and we can change the level of the automation. Yeah. If we solve the screen, we will screw everything by it. If we solve the papers, for example, we can put a robot which can solve the table, and the manual labor will do the rest. I think the combination is great. Yeah. Maybe in the video, just show it's some hard task or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's time to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Ethan. And now, Jose Ramula. In the time, I will present you the project uh, which focuses on the placement of resources, meaning power plants, where uh, provides ancillary services for the grid stabilization. First question is what is the ancillary service? What is ancillary service? When an imbalance occurs in the electricity grid, it has to be uh, annulated within a second. Uh, transmission system operators, the operator is the person who's responsible for the stability of the grid, and uh, he procures such services on, uh, on an independent market. But those services are in in the background, some technical regulation 
which reacts in the defined time when the imbalance occurs, and the second time uh, within which has to be eliminated. And those services comes in the line, which is frequency containment reserves and then uh, frequency restoration reserves. They can be described by some models. Uh, for example, when uh, in blue line, as the TSO operator requires a service and uh, uh, the service is defined by some tolerant, tolerance bands, the provider of the service has to comply with this tolerance band and provide a, a, a response by, by a technology. In the past, the uh, majority of even in nowadays, the majority of ancillary services are provided by big uh, coal fired power plants, but those power plants have to be switched off due to the carbonization of the power generation mix. Uh, this picture you can see the structure of the check uh, generation mix. On the left side are installed powers of power plants. On the right side, uh, the chart shows the generated electricity by those types of power plants. And generally, you can say that 50 to 60 percent of electricity comes from fossil fire power plants. If those will be switched off, must be replaced by some another types. And we can generally say that uh, uh, power plants accepted from environmental point of view are not acceptable from the technical point of view, and vice versa in terms of provision of uh, ancillary services. To provide ancillary service from uh, a photovoltaic power plant is very hard, at least most un almost impossible without the battery. So we are trying to propose a different solution. Different solution which uh, uh, was drafted on, on CERC is a combination of well-known uh, technologies, uh, but a combination which is not used uh, in the world. Uh, it's a combination of battery storage and uh, uh, electricity generator, which is driven by uh, turbine, uh, driven by natural gas. And this turbine has a uh, root in the, in the engines, which drives uh, airplanes, especially this one drives airplane C-130 Hercules. Uh, the set uh, equipment is uh, consumption some consumption uh, appliance, which is there just only for a certification of, of, a such, a, of a such a unit, because transmission system operators require to have such a unit to in, uh, be able to decrease the level of charge of, of, of the battery. In the past, it was used of, as I mentioned, uh, the big uh, coal fire power plants. Uh, were used to pro provide ancillary services uh, via so-called uh, spinning reserve. So uh, the operator of such a power plant runs that power plant on example 90-90% of its installed power and 10, 5 to 10% provides to the market uh, of uh, the ancillary services and try to react on the disbalance uh, in the network by, uh, by controlling that, uh, that, that spinning reserve. We are offering uh, so-called aggregation block, which is uh, more known as a virtual power plant, combining those technologies together and trying to compensate their weaknesses uh, and trying to provide, uh, uh, say, clean uh, course of power within, within the second intervals. Uh, <clears throat> what is challenging on this project is uncertainty on activation, because we don't know exact time when the, when the command from TSO comes, we don't know exact power which will be needed. Uh, commands may change every second, so there is a quite certain uncertainty. Uh, there is tolerant pain, so the, the, the service is not defined uh, by some hard equation, but we need to fly through some toleration tunnel. And uh, the turbine as the engine as the part of the aggregation block uh, is uh, normally stopped and ready to start and is activated only when it's, it is really necessary to run it, when the battery is not enough to cover the, to cover the, uh, the demand. The start time of the uh, turbine we are using is about two minutes, so we need to look forward in, in horizon about two to three, two to three minutes to try to uh, to predict uh, demand from TSO and then 
set up uh, the run of all engines to, to, to really cover the demand. Uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the beginning, the stopping sequence of the, of the turbine was even long, or much longer than the starting sequence, which uh, makes the, uh, the, the unit commitment uh, really hard. Uh, but we think that we found an algorithm uh, which is able to cope with it. Uh, we have developed uh, uh, a set of algorithms which are trying to, to cope with the uncertainty in the demand. Uh, first one is interpreter, which is trying to interpret the, the demand from the SO or the frequency, for, uh, frequency of the grid and, and plot uh, a second time series of demanded uh, power. Uh, then those uh, time series are inputted into scheduler, which is trying to find uh, the right time to start and stop all the spinning engines. Uh, then the, the module engine manager looks which turbine it will start, because uh, generally the turbines can be in any state of their, of their cycle, so we need to choose the Technically uh, feasible one and uh, with the lower, 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 lowest cost uh, to start, and then we put all the outcomes into the power balancer, and uh, it, it, it goes only to uh, cover the, the remaining power from the battery. So this is the way how we combine uh, our simple description of the way how we combine the uh, the engines in the in the virtual power plant. There's a lot of other modules, but uh, they are not uh, so important in the, the basic description. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, uh, second series of the power when uh, with the orange line is uh, generated power by the auxiliary services. In the red line is shown a level of charge of the battery system. Uh, the magenta line is power generated by uh, spinning generators, and the blue line uh, or blue curve is uh, power generated or absorbed by battery. And this is, I think, uh, in the range of a couple of hours. Uh, and down in the chart, you can see the whole week we are simulating. We have built a digital twin. So we are training the algorithms on the on the model of the technology because it's not possible to test it in the real operation of the grid. So we need to test it uh, prior to uh, commission commissioning. Uh, the project uh, is not just uh, a project supported by Toucher. Uh, it also has uh, its client, which uh, we are just negotiating with uh, the contracts to to implement those algorithms. This is a visualization of, of the power plant. Uh, this is a picture uh, from approximately late summer. Uh, and this is uh, a picture from last week. Uh, so you can see the winter romantics with the chimneys down and some interesting craning of, of 60 tons heavy turbine placing on the, on the space. So I think this is an example of the cooperation with uh, academic and industrial work. And I think that we are quite successful in that. And uh, we are trying to uh, to uh, commit the client to, uh, to, to ask for some additional functions uh, to further develop the, the, the system. Uh, we had uh, in the year 2023 uh, 10 publications uh, in, say, general conferences uh, to, uh, to uh, presentation on renowned conferences and a couple of uh, publication posts uh, in, in the different media. Uh, the project has finished uh, in December. We are disclosing it. Uh, we are starting to, to <laughs> algorithms. And in the year 2023, we'd like to act, uh, apply on program 17 plus. Uh, it's very like, uh, just, an, uh, just an, as an example of cooperation between academic and industrial work. So I, I do it for. Thank you. Thank you.
Please. Please. Comments. If not, we are nearly at the end of the workshop. The very last presentation will be given by Kozinek from the team of Professor Škoda. And I hope that uh, the image on the left side is well known. It's uh, uh, actually it was done, uh, not done by me, but it was done by architect Stranetsky. He is also sitting in uh, in this building. And uh, why there is uh, such a picture? Because uh, uh, we started uh, just to show the reactor, which is I think it's uh, not so interesting showing just a keg of steel. So that's why my colleague said it's it would like to be. If you start to sell Porsche and showing just the engine, not the nice car itself, so that's uh, that was the time we also spent like, some working on the building. But uh, this was uh, just for something intro about the templator. This is the nuclear reactor. I hope that it will be soon built somewhere. And uh, this is like another solution how to phase out coal. It was uh, said before that you can phase out by batteries. But we would like to phase out by nuclear reactor. Uh, so uh, I would like to present some, uh, let's say, more scientific results uh, regarding the work on the plater, because there are a lot of stuff we have to do. We have to calculate a lot of stuff because of, we want uh, to have uh, our nuclear reactor to work safely and predictable. And uh, one way how to do it is uh, using the multi physics calculation. So, because there are a lot of physics involved uh, in the nuclear reactor, it's uh, not just the nuclear physics, but there are some other stuff like, uh, for my part, it's thermal hydraulics. And uh, this work was regarding the multi physics of the calculations of the thermal hydraulics coupled with the neutron physics, mainly the neutron and photon transport. Uh, this was uh, presented last year. On the conference uh, on nuclear thermohydraulics, it's a top one conference on this topic, and it's uh, twice uh, it's uh, every second year. And uh, uh, title is a little bit so uh, a little bit long. And so I said I was a little bit frustrated what was going on with my post physics uh, simulations. So that was the way way how to how to put it somewhere. But uh, it's. Uh, I will uh, be brief and I will not go into the detail into the equations and so on. So uh, speaking of a uh, couple of the motor physics simulations, because uh, uh, when you start to design new reactor, uh, you need uh, some tools because usually you start with some different design, which was not here, like for actual fleet of uh, light water reactors. So we need to use uh, some, uh, let's say, more sophisticated nuclear codes which uh, were not validated against uh, the actual nuclear reactor. That's why uh, we are using high fidelity simulations. And uh, those activities uh, are continuing. Uh, I'm showing uh, in some previous conference, uh, one of my contribution, uh, one of my paper was uh, selected to be published in journal. It was uh, published this year and uh, what uh, what we are doing, uh, we are also developing some our own codes for the calculations, but uh, this part was uh, focused on uh, coupling existing code, which are uh, already uh, were validated on benchmark, not only for the nuclear reactors, like serpent code, it's a Monte Carlo code for the neutron transport. It's a well-known code uh, validated, so it's, uh, the results are trustful. And I'm using as a thermohydro guy, I'm using open foam, which is an open source CAD code. So this is the for the fluid flow and heat transfer. And uh, the, uh, my work done was to uh, basically to involve some framework which will uh, uh, let's say secure the communication between the codes. So uh, it sounds uh, maybe a little bit easy that it's uh, just some kind of communication. So, but the problem is that uh, when we uh, when we are start uh, to couple some uh, let's say different physics, there is an uh, interaction between them. And for our multi physics calculations, uh, what we have to take looks uh, are some negative temperature feedback. So for the fission, as uh, you can see, we have some 
<coughs> negative feedback effect. So like uh, thermal expansion of the fuel, when you start your fuel, uh, fuel is going to expand. So there is a less dense, so there is less probability that neutron undergoes fission. So there will be less power and so, and so forth and so forth. The same is for the moderator. If there is a less dense neutron, uh, might not be uh, slowed down as, as should be. So uh, it will slow down the moderation. So it will again change the power. And when you change the power, uh, lower power, uh, you are not heating. So your density goes up and so on. So it's uh, there is a strong coupling. And uh, there are also some problems uh, with cross sections, like with uh, the world broadening of the neutron resonance as you go to the higher temperatures. So that was a little bit stuff, I, uh, I think, uh, but uh, that's all, all has to be uh, included. So what we were doing, uh, just some steady state simulation of our reactor operation. So uh, as, a, as it is still steady state, because of this feedback, you can, you can achieve it some oscillation in your solution. So uh, I was using uh, basically over relaxation, uh, under relaxation of my uh, Solution uh, to dump the oscillation, which in normal situation they will be dumped by other effects by change of the isotopic solution. It's uh, in transient uh, solution if there is no such a behavior, but uh, still you need to focus if uh, your solution is converged. It's reasonable, and that's uh, what uh, what I was looking for in in this particular article. So uh, for the multiplicative calculations, uh, you, you need to create models. Uh, so on the images on the left side, there is some there is a model for the neutron physics. So you you are creating model where you have uh, fuel assemblies. You, uh, you include all structural materials, your coolant, your moderator, and our reactor has uh, fifty five fuel assemblies. Each of the fuel assembly contains 126 uh, fuel rods plus one instrumentation tube. Uh, so it's uh, if I'm making calculation, it's something like uh, almost 7,000 fuel rods in your code, and uh, which is uh, not such a problem for the Monte Carlo, but it's for me as a uh, thermohydro guy, it's a problem for the discretization of uh, my domain. So that's why I usually end up with uh, hundreds of millions of computational cells. So this is uh, especially this multiphysics uh, of the full core. It's uh, perfectly to use uh, some uh, with a large number of CPUs. Uh, as uh, I already mentioned, I use some over relaxation, and because it's uh, because of those uh, feedback effects, uh, the uh, let's say 10 iterations, uh, Picard iterations. So it means it's not one step, uh, one step coupling, but it's uh, you're basically changing, uh, changing your solution until you reach some convergence. So from your results, you get some power distribution in your core. This is the fuel assembly level. So you can see that uh, the power is not. Uh, 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 not uniform in your core, it's changing uh, fuel assembly by fuel assembly. And uh, that's uh, what the, you would like to uh, optimize because uh, you want to use your fuel uh, in, let's say, better better way uh, to have uniform, uh, uniform burn up. So not to spend uh, uh, some money into the fuel, which is uh, not, almost not working, I would say, simply. Uh, after, let's say, reaching some uh, convergence of my solution, uh, I saw that there are some asymmetries in my core, but uh, for the, let's say, for the fuel assemblies level, there was uh, 1%, but when you start to go into the details, into each fuel pin and into each position in the fuel pin, uh, the, basically, the, some difference between the iterations is, is higher and higher, and uh, the most problem is to assess uh, if uh, those problems are uh, important or not. And uh, our reactor is kind of unique because it's not uh, 
typical reactor as we have uh, here in Czech for the light water, you have a pressure vessel, which is full with the fuel assemblies, but our reactor is the heavy water. So we have uh, pressure tubes, which are filled with the fuel assemblies, and our moderator is separated from the coolant. So it's a, it's a vessel which uh, does not contain the fuel assemblies. Fuel assemblies are separated from the fresh tubes, and uh, our moderator, which is responsible for the moderation of the fission inside. And because uh, uh, this moderator is heated by the radiation, gamma heating, some other reactions, which I would uh, say my colleague would uh, be in details in it. So your moderator is heated, so it's changing the density. And that's the thing which uh, plays a uh, lot in the couple of, uh, couple of calculations, because uh, when you change the density of the fluid, you have a buoyancy, so your uh, fluid goes to, goes up. There is a you create some buoyant dominant flow. Uh, you change the, your field, and uh, you end up with a different let, let's say fission reaction. Uh, so uh, that's. Uh, was uh, some crazy stuff which was going on. But uh, in my investigation, I saw that the most, I, I would say, uh, crazy stuff was going in, in the locations, which is not so important for us. It was usually a location where there is a low gamma heating and there could be a high uh, change of temperature because of the flow uh, coming from the coolant, uh, coolant system and so on. And uh, the most important thing is uh, that there are no such much changes in uh, of the heat generated in this moderator. I would say in this couplet uh, calculation, the change was between like one electric kettle, which in comparison with uh, 1.6 megawatt, it's such a big deal. And this is just an uh, example of uh, how it changes. So on the left side, uh, there are some changes of the power density uh, close to the fuel assemblies. And on the right side, there are some changes uh, uh, on the temperature field during the couplets uh, calculations. And the most important thing is uh, our reactor works. And that's uh, how we are looking to do some kind of multiplication factor. So our physicists, uh, this, this is the criticality our physicists say. I, uh, as a thermal hydraulic guy, uh, criticality is something bad for me, but for them it's good. When the reactor reaches criticality, that's the best uh, what they can get because it's working sustainable. But for, uh, typically for me, if I reach criticality, I'm melting fuel and everything stops. So uh, don't be scared about the criticality uh, in the nuclear reactors. Um, I think I would uh, shortly conclude uh, our goals, what we are developing, and also the frameworks for the couplings are focused for the not only uh, for our design of the deflator for the optimization and design, but it's also focused on other stuff. Uh, and those goals could be very useful for the safety and analysis, especially for the new generation of the nuclear reactor, where uh, those couple of things play much more effect in detail. And I would so uh, thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, you know, this debate. Uh, any questions, comments? No, you can put the new. You can continue drinking the coffee for the break after, after the workshop coffee. Uh, sorry that we delayed the meeting by seven, eight minutes. It was a failure of our department. Sorry for that. Uh, at the end of the workshop, I think it was very useful workshop, high quality presentation, selected presentations. I am uh, very thankful to Zdeněk uh, Hanzale, who tried to convince all of us that such a workshop is of crucial importance, and it is really. So thank you, the next, thank you, Marcella, for helping to organize it. And I think there will be some follow-up actions, which we will discuss together at the management meeting. One of them is visit to the labs of the second part. Uh, the other one, we will uh, use the output of this workshop in evaluation of the department and in to find a way how to enhance the 
efficiency of each department, what should be done. And uh, I think uh, the third conclusion, we will organize uh, meetings which will enable to bring people together to visit the uh, labs of the neighbors and to integrate our efforts to cooperate inside the building as much as possible. Thank you very much for participation, for staying with us till the end. Now, the last word belongs to the main organizer. Yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So there are some baguettes left, so please go behind this wall and grasp some food, uh, and that's it. Okay, thank you very much, and <laughs> nice evening. <Yeah. laughs>